Well, I think we can say this is, uh, this is where we know that Truth or Consequences is more than a 1950s game show. <laughs> or that little town in southern New Mexico that named itself for the game show. And that our church administrator is too young to remember either of those because the title got in the bulletin as Truth and Consequences. <laughs> The unsettling story of Ananias and Sapphira might indeed be the first example of what happens when the truth is compromised and there are very clear consequences. Every time I've tried this favorite Bible story summer preaching exercise, somebody always submits this one. In this case, it was a top vote getter, which actually means there was more than one. And two, maybe, three. Anyway, there, there is a certain fascination with the account of Ananias and Sapphira and their consequences, and for good reason. It always seems somehow out of sync with the rest of the story, so we don't, rare, we don't give it much, much attention or much credence. Perhaps our first reaction is, really? Is that really what happened? And if so, why were Ananias and Sapphira subjected to what seems like such an unreasonable punishment? They have allegedly withheld part of the proceeds of the sale of land, and when asked directly about their actions, they didn't come clean. It's not a crime that we would expect to be punishable by death. But if it didn't happen that way, if it's just a story, why is it in the scriptures at all? Is it purposely there as a counterbalance to the account of Barnabas' generosity? Or is it just a cautionary tale? Bottom line, what are we supposed to make of it? The next thing that probably follows is that punishment, this particular punishment, doesn't fit the crime. At least not in our justice system. Even Bernie Madoff only got life in prison, and his wife Ruth has yet to be charged with anything. In a funny way, it kind of reminds me of something that happened in my family a number of years ago, but not quite as shocking, don't worry. My family is as strange as the next one, but not that kind of strange. Neither do we run Ponzi schemes on the side. Anyway, it's just a good crime and punishment story. For reasons that will forever remain unclear, my sister and her husband decided that they would retire to the country and raise emus. You know emus, those large prehistoric looking birds. Now this was during the 1980s when many of the upscale restaurants in Denver were putting exotic meats on their menus and emu was being touted as the most healthy alternative to beef. They saw their future secured by this cottage industry, apparently not thinking about the fact that they were in the middle of cattle country. <laughs> Nevertheless, the perfect hobby farm was found and the pens were built and with a great deal of fanfare, the emus arrived. Now, if you know anything at all about emus, you know that they are fast, they are mean, and they are not the brightest bulb in the box. <laughs> the crew managed uh, sorry, while they, were, while they were unloading them, several of them escaped. And the crew managed to round up all but one, who took off down the road and across the railroad tracks and headed into town, where it immediately became a public safety issue. The emu made it as far as the Dairy Queen <laughs> before being dispatched by somebody with good aim. Now, upon hearing this story, one of my friends remarked that ending its life just because it wanted a peanut buster parfait seemed a little harsh. <laughs> the punishment didn't seem to fit the crime. And just so you don't wonder, all through the rest of the sermon, the emu adventure didn't last. Emu never became the next white meat or the sirloin of the future or even the new chicken. The only livestock around the farm these days are a few barn cats and one old dog. And my sister is quite happy growing vegetables and running the children's program at the Methodist Church. My brother-in-law is content puttering around the South 40 and drinking coffee at the local cafe with the other retired ranchers. 
Now the story of Ananias and Sapphira would fall into the category of sermons seldom preached. Perhaps no surprise there. It doesn't appear in the common lectionary. It's not one of those that preachers would choose, at least not the more liberal or progressive preachers. When I tried to find any commentary or sermon material online, I found that it's a popular text for the extremely evangelical or Pentecostal churches when it comes to talking about money and giving and stewardship and the consequences of not giving back to God in decent measure. But not so much for the more mainline congregations. We don't tend to threaten dire consequences when it comes to our giving or lack thereof. Two things to think about here. The first is the whole idea, the whole concept of community possession. Specifically how that concept has come to be interpreted through the centuries based largely on the book of Acts and Paul's writings and how it impacts our life together in the church today. The other is what it takes to be a life-giving, resilient, healthy congregation. Which behaviors or attitudes or attributes make life together worth it? And which ones eventually unravel the cord that binds us? Probably most of us who have read the account of the post-Pentecost community in the book of Acts have said, or at least have thought, if we didn't say it out loud, why isn't the church like that? Why can't the church be more like that? Why have we allowed our selfishness and our greed and our apathy and our insensitivity to define us instead of our love for one another? Why do we not strive more deliberately for the ideal as it is described in the scriptures? The one that talk about 3,000 people being baptized and people giving freely of their possessions and property for the common good, not a single person being needy because of the spirit of generosity and sharing that filled the community. How have we gotten so far away from that? What's wrong with us? We would all like to believe that the Bible provides a clear and unequivocal ethical mandate for how we manage our having and our giving how we are to understand ourselves relative to our possessions, however many they are, or what form they happen to be. But does it? Well-respected New Testament scholar Luke Timothy Johnson has spent decades of research and reflection on the meaning of wealth and possession in the books of Luke and the book of Acts. In his book, Sharing Possessions, Johnson writes, the mandate of faith in God is clear. We must, in some fashion, share that which has been given to us by God as a gift. To refuse to share what we have is to act idolatrously. But, and this is an important but, the ways of sharing possessions are determined by the discernment of the Spirit that leads us in the path of obediential faith and service, a discernment of the circumstances of our calling, and the genuine needs of the moment. Johnson goes on to remind us that the scriptures do not present for our consideration or our implementation any grand scheme for the proper disposition of possessions. There is no Christian economic structure to be found in the Bible any more than there is a Christian political structure or educational system. The Bible does not tell us how to organize our lives together. In other words, while we're looking for rules that will tell us what to do, what we find instead, particularly in Luke Acts, is what Johnson calls a diversity of mandates rather than a unified theory of stewardship. Johnson argues that the reason we don't get this unified field theory in the Bible is because Christianity isn't an ethical system that tells us what we're supposed to do all the time. Instead, it tells us who we are. And through the shaping of our identity, we grow to discern which mandate of the many given in scripture is the best one to be followed at any given moment. Now that may not be what we wanted to hear. Let's face it, it would be a whole lot easier if we could fall back on one clear set of instructions to interpret the very clear mandate to share what God has given us. Instead, we get the freedom to make those decisions based on circumstance and the presence of the Spirit to guide our discernment. What we find in the account of the post-Pentecost community is what the writer of Luke and Acts presents as the ideal 
for that particular community at that particular time in that particular circumstance. Johnson contends that given the rest of his narrative and teaching, there is no reason to think that the writer of Luke Acts expected every subsequent Christian community to practice a strict community of goods. Now back to Ananias and Sapphira and their unfortunate decision to lie about their circumstances, which brings us to what I think is the more compelling issue in this passage, and that is how we sustain a life-giving, resilient, and healthy community. If we assume that the ideal of community possession of goods is not the driving force here, why was the punishment so drastic? Why were these two people struck dead instead of simply being thanked for what they did give up and left to live with their deceit, which probably would have caught up with them sooner or later? Because, of course, as the text implies, they lied about the transaction. It wasn't so much the fact that they withheld part of the proceeds. After all, they were probably in the majority when it came right down to laying down, selling everything and laying down the proceeds at the feet of the apostles. It was rather that they were untruthful, that their decision betrayed the community and ultimately God. Peter said, you did not lie to us, but to God. And it's also clear that their dishonesty affected the balance and the harmony in the community. If you were part of the conversation about hospitality earlier this year, you heard me make reference to an article in Christian Century that detailed what the author called four practices of healthy congregations. She writes, in reflecting on what builds up and what breaks down communities, acts of fidelity and betrayal, truthfulness and deception, gratitude, envy, grumbling, welcome and exclusion often come to mind. One of those practices is living truthfully. As part of the post-Pentecost community, we're in the business of practicing resurrection. And it's hard to sustain that practice when we are not honest with ourselves and honest with others in the community, when we are not living truthfully in our relationships. That includes our relationships with one another, of course, and more importantly, with God. Living truthfully allows us to speak the truth in love, which is probably the one thing most of us have never managed to do well, especially in our relationships in the church, precisely because it often threatens to undo relationships that we have worked hard to make and sustain. And speaking truthfully is difficult and often risky in the absence of commitment or fidelity to one another. The author points out what we all already know, that small betrayals often do a surprising amount of damage. Consider, for example, the damage done to the early church by the lie that betrayed the unscrupulous intentions of Ananias and Sapphira. We read that great fear seized the whole church and all who heard these things. The author goes on to remind us that because of the impact of betrayal on trust and relationships, we are often harsh with those who break significant promises or violate commitments. She writes, instead of responding to sin or human weakness redemptively, some communities, in effect, shoot their wounded, and then suggest that, that how we respond to betrayal and how we continue in love becomes a major test of individual and communal character. One commentator has suggested that perhaps the story of Ananias and Sapphira metaphorically represents a dying community when we, one by one or two by two, choose self over community rather than self and community. Realistically, we will never regain or achieve the ideal community that is portrayed in the book of Acts. Truth to tell, we probably wouldn't want to and we don't need to. Mercifully, we have the freedom to choose the circumstance and behavior of our own unique faith community that is life-giving rather than death-dealing. We can choose self and community, always aware that our lives are inextricably linked by our faith in the one God who redeems our mistakes, our incredibly bad decisions, our betrayals, and our lies with the grace of compassion and forgiveness and love. There is no better place to start. May it always be so. Amen.